In the last four programs, I have explored with a number of guests a profoundly different way of looking at the issues of family and community, health, learning, and work. In this last program, I want to explore some of the underlying implications of these shifts in thinking. The first half of this talk will deal with a radically different view of reality than with that which dominates our current thinking. The second will talk about the steps you can take in your own life and in your various communities once you decide to move in positive directions. The underlying message of these programs is that the survival of humanity depends on a dramatic shift in the way we think about each other. Today we are largely driven by a belief in original sin. We feel that most people, most of the time, will behave destructively and less constrained by coercive power. This also plays into the denigration of women because we are reminded of the line from the Adam and Eve story that the woman tempted me and I fell. The ideas advanced in this set of programs assume that most people, most of the time, want to develop themselves and others. Matthew Fox describes this way of looking at the world as original blessing. The reason this commitment is not widely visible is that the culture in which we are currently living all too often inhibits its potential. Many of our institutional structures require people to behave in destructive ways if they are to be able to put food on the table and to look after their children. We have come to accept that we must live in ways which damage our own dreams and those of others. John Maynard Keynes, arguably the greatest economist of our times, made this point in an essay entitled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. He said that our descendants would be able to recognize for the vices they actually are those actions we now proclaim as the highest virtues. He wrote in the 1930s, we are now at the time when we can take his words to heart. If we are to survive the 21st century, we must abandon our negative vision of the world and learn to live through a positive vision of hope. We can begin to imagine the re-enchantment of the world and our lives, a theme used by a growing number of authors. I believe that it is possible for us to live our lives as though physical and mental health is the norm. I believe that social and environmental systems tend to heal themselves if given a chance. I believe that we can define the world in terms of opportunities and potentials rather than problems and difficulties. I am not, however, a utopian. I do not see the human race achieving perfection. Indeed, in some ways, the directions I am proposing imply more conflict rather than less. The world I see emerging in the future accepts that people and groups will interpret reality from different points of view. Living in such a world will require that we come to understand the process of dialogue and group interaction in far more creative ways. We can learn to dance with our differences rather than fight over them. In the short run, as we struggle to achieve the transition from past success criteria to new ones, we shall have to recognize that the drive to health is blocked in many people, institutions, and systems. There are a huge number of reasons for these blocks, but we shall work very differently with them once we recognize that our task is to break through to the inherent natural healing forces, which exist in most people most of the time. I am therefore not arguing that all people can be healed. There are people who have been so warped by their experiences that there is no way their behaviors are going to change. Any systems we bring into existence must recognize that a small proportion of people will, for any foreseeable future, try to take advantage of others. There is another issue that needs to be faced. While human and ecological systems do recover if given a chance, there are all too many examples and times and places where they have been so stressed that they move permanently into new and often less desirable forms. The underlying thread of the 21st century is that the human pressures and wastes of an excessive population will break the natural equilibrium, spurring the poor horsemen of the apocalypse to a ride of terror over the whole planet. For example, the latest evidence on overfishing of the world's oceans provides a far more chilling picture than is generally known to the public. In this talk, therefore, I shall discuss two primary challenges. 
First, what changes do we need to make in our basic ways of thinking? Second, how can each of us play a role in making the urgently needed changes? In this latter part of my remarks, I shall recognize that there is no quick fix or panacea for current difficulties. Improvements will come slowly as we change our thinking and action patterns. The crucial recognition we must accept if we are to move forward is the theme that has run throughout this set of programs, that all organisms do possess a drive to health. This vision is so different than that which has driven our cultures for so long that it is difficult to even broach the subject within our dominant modes of thinking. We have become so used to fixing things that this is the only approach we often consider. We fix our hyperactive children with Ritalin, our depression with Prozac, our lack of self-worth with alcohol and drugs. We fix our social problems with legislation. All too often we fix our environmental difficulties with more intervention to cause past failures. And we fix our illness problems with drugs to which the next generation of germs and viruses will develop resistance. This is causing an increasingly recognized threat to our ability to deal with past and future diseases. Technology is indeed a highly effective cure for immediate problems. The difficulty is that it inevitably has further consequences that we usually fail to perceive. One of the most dramatic of all the examples of the de is the development of the automobile. We have created a world dependent on abundant individual transportation. The consequences have been pervasive, including the destruction of neighborhoods. The 21st century will certainly require the reversal of many decisions foisted on us by the inertia of the automobile culture. There are alternatives to our current strategies, which are based on technological fixes and a belief that there is one best way. Anybody who looks at the available evidence will find that human beings often cure themselves if given time and space. Indeed, some of the cures which are clearly on the record appear miraculous. The most dramatic recoveries from environmental problems have come as the insults which have been causing degradation have been removed and natural forces freed up to work. This has been true, for example, in the Great Lakes and the Hudson River in the United States. In the social field, it has been the commitment of individuals and groups, rather than legislation, that has led to the most remarkable turnarounds in neighborhoods and communities. Our global culture can only thrive when we accept that the push to health is fundamental. It is true that we fail all too often, but we need to concentrate on our positive efforts rather than to be fixated on our failures. Remaining conscious of the need for health is difficult because healthy states once attained quickly become invisible. As Heraclitus pointed out millennia ago, it is sickness that makes health sweet because without it health is taken for granted. We need to look at opportunities instead of problems, potentials instead of deficits, to live with hope rather than fear. This move toward health as the natural state needs to be accompanied by several other shifts in consciousness if we are to be able to live well in the 21st century. First, we need to focus on the journey of life rather than the fixed destination that we imagine to be at the end of the road. Many years ago, I produced a dialogue on work. One of the authors caught the way we used to view life. He argued that we prepared to work, prepared to retire, and prepared to die. His point that was that we were always looking to the future rather than enjoying the present. Life was conceptualized as having a, a destination, and our success or failure was to be measured in terms of whether we eventually reached the destination we had set for ourselves. In the future, we shall live as though we are on a journey. We shall recognize that all our choices determine where we move throughout our lives, and that major breakpoints often emerge from apparently trivial causes. We shall come to understand that we can only live well if we concentrate on the moment in which we are actually alive. We shall also learn to live with the real, even though it may be painful, for it is only as we work from what actually exists that we can expect to change it. I have been fascinated to see the emergence of this journey rhetoric in popular culture, as well as in more theoretical studies. The implications are, of course, deep and wide. 
If we cannot plan our lives as we have believed was possible in the industrial era, then most of the tactics and strategies we have learned during our educational process are no longer valid. Instead of strategically planning the future, we need to develop a vision which permits us to make the choices which are best for us as we move through an endless series of choice points. This kind of vision is not a scenario projected into the future, but a power of seeing the reality which actually presents itself to us. You will be more intensely conscious when you choose to live your journey. You will no longer exist in a cultural trance accepting the norms and values of others as absolutes. You will also become intensely aware of the need to understand the behavior patterns of friends and colleagues so that shared decisions and directions are possible. In the future, we shall all need to operate in partnership, not being forced to act through top-down power and not pretending that everybody's skills and knowledge are equal. One of the largest changes in the last 50 years is around our thinking about leadership and authority. When I was growing up, it was widely assumed that those at the top of systems understood what was needed by virtue of their position. Today, this assumption is increasingly challenged. But despite the needs of more and more people, we still act as though some individual will come along and resolve all the problems of the world. Although we know intellectually that no elected leader will be able to order the future for us, the rhetoric of our election suggests that the fate of the country and possibly the world is in the balance. The alternative view which has emerged most widely to challenge the traditional top-down authority model is that of flat systems, where everybody is equally competent. Today, a growing number of systems are paralyzed because there are no processes which permit definitive decisions to be made. There are no accepted standards of judgment within institutions and society as a whole. To make matters worse, issues can be opened and reopened endlessly. There is no willingness to accept what has been decided and to move on to the next issue. Part of the problem here is that we have attempted to substitute the law for the process of public debate and dialogue. There are two reasons for this. One is that people seem less and less willing to take on the responsibilities of citizens. The other is that we want tidy solutions rather than the messy process which is inevitably part of a well-functioning society. It is time for us to recognize that neither top-down nor flat systems will enable effective de decision-making. In Rian Eisler's term, we need partnership approaches. This means that we are constantly in tension between two choices. On the one hand, each of us has the skills in certain areas to make good decisions. But we also know that if we do so, people will not learn to stretch themselves. On the other hand, while we know that we need to let others try out their wings, certain choices are so critical that one's superior knowledge needs to be applied in order to avoid catastrophic failures. The needed shift toward partnership is part of a far broader area of change. Our current thinking is largely based on dichotomies between right and wrong, good and evil, top-down and flat. We are discovering that the real world is far more complex and less clear-cut. Finding ways to dance with uncertainty and continuous choice is one of the primary challenges of the 21st century. The second step we need to take is toward examining issues in positive rather than negative terms, in a search for strengths and breakthrough potentials. Western culture has a profound bias towards examining the negative rather than the positive. In this area, as in all others, however, there is a need for balance. We need to search for the strengths that people, organizations, and cultures have. We must not, however, ignore the fact that these strengths taken to extremes inevitably lead to weaknesses. In more and more fields of study and work, the emphasis is shifting towards positive styles. For example, community work increasingly looks at potentials and assets rather than deficits. The result is to set free opportunities which would have been hidden by concentrating on the difficulties which neighborhoods and communities are experiencing. The same patterns emerge as people are reminded of their strengths. The problem with this line of argument is that it is all too often taken to extremes. Positive thinking does free up people to be more creative. 
But if an individual forgets the shadow side, he is all too likely to ride roughshod over the needs of others who have less strength, power, or position. There is a need to respect the needs of others as well as to search for one's own bliss. In addition, it is all too possible to forget that there are real limits. The belief in the possibility of endless maximum economic growth is an example of what can happen on a societal level when positive thinking loses all sense of context and reality. A third step is to recognize that all people and situations are, are unique. Our tendency to rely on statistical realities often disguises more than it reveals. Just as the journey rhetoric is becoming common in ordinary discourse, so is the assumption that everybody is unique. Interestingly, one hears it particularly in financial ads which proclaim the ability of brokerages to look after each investor separately. The fact that this claim is all too often bogus does not detract from the fact that these companies are tapping into the deep desire of each individual to be seen as their own person. We do need to remember that this is a profoundly new trend. Only a short time ago, people did not want to stand out. Behaviors were primarily defined by age, sex, class, color, sexual orientation. These patterns are now breaking down and it is less and less possible to be sure that people will think like others who share their obvious characteristics. People are learning to think for themselves and to make up their own minds. Our tendency to think in terms of averages and statistical norms is however deeply ingrained. One of the examples that fascinates me is in terms of family size. It is now obvious that global health requires a rapid decline in the number of children who are born. The usual proposal is that each family should have a smaller number of children. I have never heard anybody suggest the obvious answer, that many couples should not have children because they are not prepared or inclined to be parents, while some family who have great nurturing skills should have larger families. Once we think in terms of uniqueness, the issue of diversity is transformed. It becomes clear that fixation on obvious characteristics can separate rather than unite. A deep understanding of this reality would make it possible to transform the currently sterile debate about whether the previously disadvantaged need help. We would see that we should be concentrating on the currently dispossessed regardless of age, sex, color, etc. A fourth urgently needed change is to recognize that effectiveness requires people to be profoundly present in the moment. This is only possible if people have time to center themselves through the reduction of stress and fatigue. How often have you been in meetings when you had an eerie feeling that people were really agreeing with each other but were just arguing about words? Have you sometimes stopped the flow of the discussion and said, but aren't you actually saying the same thing? There are at least three critical reasons for this failure to communicate. The first is that people are typically aiming to advance their agenda and listening to the flow of conversation in terms of how they can manipulate it. They are not concerned with the potential synergies which could emerge. The second is that people are so tired, so stressed, so overloaded that they are rarely present in their activities. They are thinking about their other responsibilities and urgencies. There is little chance that they will connect with new ideas and potentials if they are struggling with their ongoing problems and crises. One of the problems of our time is that many of our decision makers are bone tired and have not had the time to relax fully for many months or years. The third is that we have been taught to listen for disagreement rather than agreement. Our style is to respond with but rather than and. We do not look for the agreements we share, but for the disagreements we have. We even create disagreements when we have the chance. This style reaches its peak of absurdity in academic settings, when totally unrealistic assumptions are accepted as true because we are too busy arguing about details. In the process, reality gets totally lost. It is fair to say that my life was transformed when I recognized that the way to work with people was to enter a conversation looking for the point where there was common ground. Once I could find it, I could build on it and often took the dialogue in directions which none of us anticipated. 
People can only learn what they are ready to understand. Surfacing issues that people do not yet grasp or are denying is a waste of time. Teaching and organizing take on a very different flavor in these conditions. There is a further critical point we need to grasp here. When we disagree with people, we normally assume that the other person hears what we are saying and is reacting negatively to it. We forget that, as Gregory Bateson has pointed out, all messages are coded. The most critical failures to communicate occur when one person is unable to decode the message received. This leaves a painful gap in our comprehension, which we often paper over rather than confronting. I call this the black hole problem. The way to deal with the black hole is not to become more intensely focused and probably more angry. People do not learn truly different ideas by being beaten on the head. The process is far more indirect. Mindquakes occur indirectly as people are invited to look at the world in different ways. It is now time to face the underlying issue of our time head on and to recognize the very difficult challenge that those of us who want to create a different culture need to face. The current discussions between those who want fundamental change and those who want to perpetuate the current culture is necessarily a dialogue between deaf people. The two sets of ideas which are currently in conflict emerge from two incompatible views. One results from a very long pattern of human history when people have seen themselves as able to manipulate nature and the world for their benefit. This is the set of beliefs which has produced the modern world in which we currently live. The other view, which is both new and very old, would heal the split between man and nature. In its old patterns, it goes back to the models which Western societies call primitive. In its modern incarnation, it is based on the sciences of chaos, complexity, fractal geometry, etc. The essence of this view is that the web of life has all actions as interactions, and attempts to manipulate objects in the web will always have unintended results. This is in many ways a clash between the values which the West has called feminine and those it has defined as masculine. The emphasis on process and collaboration which is required in the future is more commonly shown by women than men, although this is a tendency, of course, rather than a rule. This shift and the relevance of the values of the two sexes adds one more breakpoint to the number which are challenging the society. Given these clashes, it is not surprising that the 80s and 90s have been decades with increasingly high levels of stress. If we are to confront today's challenges effectively, we must enable people to find the time and commitment to look at the realities, breaking out of the cultural trance which lulls us into soporific slumber. Remember, rats trapped in punishing mazes sometimes defend themselves by falling asleep. Only when this breakout from our trance happens can we hope to see an effective movement launched to challenge the current materialistic and technological drives of our culture. As a rational analyst, I fear that we shall not muster the necessary will. My over 40 years of work in this field have taught me the enormous inertia of the current system. There is a tendency to do what seems to be necessary without looking for the alternatives which do exist today. When I started this work 40 years ago, people clearly believed that my approaches were unrealistic. I was told over and over again that we're not ready for that. Today people tell me that what I am saying is deeply relevant, but we seem unable as a culture to respond to the challenge that so many of us perceive. The tragedy behind this passive reaction is that a deep, inchoate learning for profound change already exists and its visibility only awaits an effective catalyst. My lifetime's work has shown me that people are now ready to challenge the current conventional wisdom. Many know that their lives, their work, their professions, their political parties are without the deep meaning for which they yearn. They are waiting for a wake-up call that will give them the faith and the courage to believe that their actions will make a difference. Change agents no longer have to convince people of the need to change direction. This work has already been done. 
Rather, they need to propose approaches and provide spaces in which humanity can explore the dramatic changes required to regain our souls. It is, of course, easy to pronounce a clarion call for new directions. The harder task is to find and commit to a set of approaches which enable people to make a difference. The last part of this talk will therefore deal with the specifics of what is needed to create the depth of change that is now so urgently required in our global cultures. I shall deal primarily with how we can help people work with the profoundly new models that have been suggested by my guests. But first I must go back over the three processes which are required before people can be expected to face the need for developing profoundly new success criteria in their lives. I described these in the first talk of the series, describing them as three overlapping acts or a drama. The first act has made a very large number and broad range of people aware that the structures of the industrial era are no longer working. Indeed, it is being realized that the very idea of structure is itself basically flawed. We are discovering that life is made up of flows and networks rather than of fixed hierarchies and systems. Flexibility and flux are central to life. This challenge to the industrial era needs to continue. And there are many people working at this level. But we also need to recognize that there is a profound danger in work of this type now that more and more people are conscious of the breakdown in our past understandings. Those who bring news of still more crises are likely to be greeted with the explicit or implicit statement, I already know of more problems than I can manage. I don't need an additional one. The new and most exciting work is therefore not at this level. The second act has made people aware that the emphasis on the contribution of white Anglo males has biased our understanding of reality and history. A wide range of competing understandings of reality has emerged as a result. There are different models for men and women, for young and old, for those of different sexual orientations, for the handicapped, for people of different racial and ethnic groups. The wide divergence of these views has fragmented our ability to make sense of the rapid changes now developing around us. This step was indeed a necessary one, for it gave previously disadvantaged groups a sense of the validity of their own history. People needed time to work through their rejection of the white male Anglo vision. And there is still much work to be done to deal with the consequences of past discrimination. But it is now vital that we recognize that our cultural differences are contained within a broader, shared reality. Only this step can enable us to think through the immediate challenges of the rapidly changing world in which we live. The third act of the 80s and 90s has seen on the surface a re-emphasis on maximum economic growth and international competitiveness. But underneath the surface, the dynamics have been quite different. These years have been, as I said, the decades of stress. At the practical level, the stress has come from the speeding up of decision-making processes, the lengthening of hours of work, and the addition of more people to the labor force. There has also been a breakdown of the commitment between employer and employee, where good work was rewarded with continued employment. Meanwhile, to the traditional pressure of keeping up with the Joneses, we have added the challenge of keeping up with ever more complex technology. For example, many car owners used to be able to mend their own cars. Their complexity today increasingly forces garage repairs. There is little open discussion of this act in the drama, but most people are only too well aware of its reality in their own lives. Just talking to them about this issue will bring their concerns to the surface. Work to complete this act and therefore accompany the activities we take up for Act 4, to which the rest of this talk will be directed. I have been excited in recent months to see that classes and audiences which have had little ex previous exposure to this set of ideas nevertheless hear their own deep personal concerns reflected in them. What then is the core challenge of Act 4, the act we now need to complete? It is to find a profoundly new starting point for our thoughts and our actions. 
It is like the old cartoon of the lost automobile driver asking a local how to reach her destination. The response is that she cannot get where she wants to go from where she currently is. We have to face the same message at a far deeper level about our cultural dilemma. Any survivable future will start from a radically different set of premises from those that have supported the industrial era. Until we have come to grips with the extent and depth of the necessary changes, any proposals we make will inevitably result in moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic. There is a fascinating struggle connected with fundamental change work. It requires two very different attitudes that are profoundly difficult to keep separate. On the one hand, it requires an absolute conviction that the structures, styles, and patterns of the industrial era must be abandoned. This is a commitment which cannot be compromised. There is already far more evidence to prove this point than can possibly be needed. On the other hand, there is an absolute need for a profound level of humility about what the new patterns need to be, and to make even things even more difficult which parts of our current living patterns can be taken forward into the next period of history. In addition, we have to recognize that the range and extent of changes which are taking place are so great that any attempt to impose a single pattern will necessarily be flawed and unsuccessful. The only hope is for all those who are committed to supporting the change process to listen to all the voices which show a willingness to move beyond the pieties of the past and to struggle out of the cultural trance that numbs all of us. We are all deeply booby-trapped by our past understandings. It is extraordinarily difficult to realize the core shift that is imposed by the movement out of the industrial era. The standard of judgment for the future will not be that of the expert or the professional operating out of a theoretical base. Rather, it will be the individual and the group that it will seek its truth in the reality of its own situation. In doing so, we shall increasingly be able to tap into the deep levels of wisdom which exist in many ethical and religious traditions around the world and which are increasingly being proved by experimentation. We are at the point where scientific and religious spiritual understandings are converging. One can argue that religion is primitive modern science or that modern science is primitive religion depending on one's biases. In either case, the ways in which we need to learn to think are profoundly different from those which have been dominant up to the present time. As we have talked about health and learning, work, family and communities, the primary challenge we have seen is to find ways which enable people to make sense of their own lives as individuals and in groups. They can, of course, get help from colleagues and friends. They can get information from professionals and experts in particular fields. But in the end, they have to be responsible for making their own choices. For these choices must be based on their own understandings, intuitions, and values. What tools do we have to make the profound shifts in perspective which are required if we are to move beyond the industrial era? The first step is to fully recognize what will not work. We cannot do the work required on the basis of logic. Our learning must necessarily operate at a far deeper level of consciousness. Our work must be done at the mythic level, far beyond the limited powers of our logical and intellectual tools. The arts give us the best access to this area of our consciousness. I have suggested for many years that the type of work I do should be described as arting the universe. I do not claim to be an art scholar in any sense. However, when I was at Cambridge University many years ago, I listened to Nicholas Pevsner give a series of lectures about the Renaissance. His overarching theme was the way artists of this period changed the way in which people looked at the world. Painting moved from being two-dimensional to being three-dimensional through the introduction of perspective. This shift took place at the same time as we were accepting that the world was round rather than flat. How can the arts help us to see the patterns which were emerging around us today? The wording I've used here is carefully chosen. It is not a matter of creating an artistic vision. 
Rather, the challenge is to help people see what is already developing. Our world is being changed by an immensely strong set of forces that remain invisible to most of us. As a result, the decisions we make are all too often irrelevant to the real opportunities of our time, and thus have negative consequences. I recall all too vividly listening to a professor at one of the most prestigious universities in Canada announce that a committee set up to improve the university was producing results that were either trivial or counterproductive. Let me use one obvious example to illustrate this point. Throughout the world there are profound concerns about the effect of aging of populations. Today's discussion is usually about how to stretch limited funds to secure the well-being of the retired. In order to do this, all sorts of shifts are being suggested, such as retirement and later ages, or means testing retirement income. There is hardly a whisper about the possibility that the concept of retirement itself will turn out to be an industrial era phenomenon, which will be abandoned in the future. We could aim to provide everybody with an opportunity to contribute to their own development and that of the society throughout their lives. What then do I mean by the arts? I am using this word as a shorthand for a whole range of non-rational approaches to the world in which we live. Unfortunately, there is all too much evidence that throughout our cultures we are denying the need for the arts and the humanities. We are turning our universities into technical schools that teach short-term information. Universities indeed continue to show their priorities by the programs they choose to support and cancel. We still prefer bean counters to people of vision. We ask the arts to support themselves within a consumption system that will inevitably prefer the trivial to the challenging. And above all, we distrust people and feed them pap rather than the substantial doubt which will enable them to find their own future. The tragedy, of course, is that this direction will create a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is true that technology can solve many of our short-run problems, but the holes which now exist in our spirits and souls cannot be filled by technology. Our addictions will worsen until we reconnect to each other and to the natural world. There are many ways in which individuals can reconnect with their deeper needs and potentials. This connection can come from a trauma or peak experience. It can be provoked by a dialogue or by a visit to the theater. It can come by connection to a new person or group who challenges the depths. It can be provoked by a near-death experience. In certain cultures, it is routinely supported by practices which modern societies have largely abandoned, such as rites of passage from one stage of life to another, or the use of mind-altering substances in specific cultural contexts which are carefully crafted. Instead of alcohol and drugs being recreational, they are used to support the opportunity to see the world from a different viewpoint. The challenge I want to discuss in the rest of this talk, however, is how the many individual transformations which have already taken place can be brought together to break the inertia of industrial era structures. I shall make suggestions about pragmatic steps which can be taken to move society forward toward the profound transformation that is so urgently required. These steps all need to be taken concurrently so the order in which they are listed is not significant. You will also hear at the very end how you can be involved in some developing dynamics. One of the profound challenges of the immediate future is to discover a shared vision which will permit us to reorganize society so that it reflects the emerging realities of the future rather than the structures of the past. It is my conviction that the first step is to provide a place where a growing number of people can feel comfortable and admitting that they know the industrial era is failing and are then prepared to act on this belief. We need words and images which will evoke this sense of commitment. As I have already said, the most resonant and evocative image I have found so far is to call the 21st century the healing century, 
contrasting such a vision with the economic and technological dynamics of the 20th. I have also discovered that people can hear the suggestion that we should concentrate on the quality of life rather than the quantity of goods. An individual whose life had been destroyed by a tornado in Florida expressed this changing emphasis by saying she was fine and that all she had lost was stuff, a word which seems to be increasingly used as a way of pouring scorn on consumption and materialism. We must, however, move beyond just words into ways in which the multiple implications of new directions can be broadly shared. We need a very short resource list which we could challenge those interested to read or view so that there would be a shared knowledge base and a common language as we came together to dialogue and work. There could also be a far more extensive bibliography so that as people become more interested they could follow their own directions as easily as possible. The Healing Century could also become a section in bookstores. One of the important steps in developing the women's movement was taken when all the books on the subject were gathered in a single place. The extent and coherence of the set of ideas became visible. The same result could happen as various expressions of the new way of looking at the world, which is emerging in many areas of society, were brought together. People would come to see that there was an increasingly coherent viewpoint which challenged the dying industrial era norms. The healing century could reflect the growing understanding that all parts of reality are interconnected by providing a new way of linking books and ideas. As we see how much has already been done, we can become more aware that the vast majority of the intellectual work which is taking place in today's society aims to maintain the obsolete industrial era rather than to understand the emerging realities. The recognition of healing as a core reality forces us to decide how re to reflect reality if everything is indeed interconnected. We therefore need to think in terms of pictures instead of maps. The patterns of our activities also must change. We need to move away from systems run for the convenience of those who manage and administer them and toward approaches which are centered on those who are being supported by the services. In health, this means finding ways to enable people to mobilize their own defenses to maintain their equilibrium, and intervening in ways which are supportive of future healing rather than destructive of its potential. In learning, this means providing everyone with the opportunity to discover their own strengths while supporting their uniqueness. In the field of work, it demands that we look for opportunities for people to enjoy what they do and to find the resources they need for their right livelihood. And when we think about family, neighborhood, and community, we need to use the real context of our times rather than be trapped within the norms of the vanished agricultural and industrial eras. Most of the structures we have inherited are not serving us well. Indeed, the very fact that we think in terms of structure rather than process inhibits the required new understandings. We are being forced to make truly massive changes in the ways we behave. Fortunately, they have already started and are, in fact, more developed than we realize. They are, however, often hidden by the power of the rhetorics used by the power elites, who argue that we should pay attention to the economy and ignore the changes that are happening in the society. The alienation of the public from the power elites of our cultures continues to widen. There is a radical disconnect between the issues that seem important to politicians, academics, and the media, and those which concern citizens. One of our tasks is to set up alternative means of communications. These are already emerging through the power of the Internet, which is breaking the monopoly on the news which has been held by a small group of people for so long. One of my hopes for this series is that a movement will spring up around each of the four topics examined in these talks. I hope that we shall see an increasingly intense conversation about the ways we stay healthy, learn, work and live together, and that colleges and universities will become part of these processes rather than bastions of industrial era thought. It will also help positive change if people discover what's working. This effort is important at two levels. 
First, there is a widespread sense of pessimism about our ability to deal with the crises of our time. This is enhanced by the constant drumbeat of negative news that is often seen as the way to sell newspapers and gets TV programs watched. William Raspberry, a syndicated columnist, has developed a model which has been widely adopted to get positive news more widely seen. Each day a column appears on the front page of the local newspaper. Any staffer can submit a story for this space. The only requirement is that it shows some part of the community that is creating positive energy. The chosen piece is signed so that credit is gained. The experience of papers which have tried this approach has been highly positive, both from the point of view of the public and those on the paper. And as a result, the practice has spread quite widely in North America. But we also need a broader sense of what's working. There is no need to constantly reinvent the wheel. There are a growing number of highly positive approaches which have been developed in different parts of the country and the world which can be adapted to the needs of other localities. These are increasingly being catalogued in print and also on the internet. One of the most important areas in which society is on a very steep learning curve is around new ways of being with people in dialogue. There are a growing number of approaches which encourage people to discover their agreements rather than to concentrate on their conflicts. Working in this way is difficult for all of us, however, because as I have already said, we tend to look for buts rather than ands. We need to understand that the feel of a dialogue is very different from that of an argument or a debate. The challenge is to listen intently and to discover the truths of each of the people who is in the room. Each individual makes the connections which seem right to them. I have been personally been particularly touched by two experiences in the last 18 months. One of them has been an emerging process in the city of Victoria in Canada. A number of people have linked themselves in the group with no name. They believe that keeping themselves free of set description or goals provides them with the ability to manage their dynamic creatively. There is, in effect, only one rule. That the group is for dialogue and not for action. Individual members of the group and groups of members can, of course, act. But the overall group provides a neutral space where people can learn to listen and think together. In my opinion, the results have been dramatic. The last time I had the pleasure of being with the group, two realities emerged. The first was the extraordinary ability of the group to integrate voices and thoughts, which in other circumstances would have been profoundly disruptive. The second was the fact that when several members of the group with no name met with other organizations, the dialogue style they had learned affected the other groups and conversations became less confrontational and more constructive. My other experience is more personal and smaller scale. After a recent serious operation, a group of people came together, most of whom did not know or hardly knew each other. Our ostensible purpose was to help me see my future choices more clearly. It rapidly became obvious that this definition was too narrow. The five of us have been learning how to share our ongoing personal experiences. We are finding that we learn from each other at several levels and that our experiences illuminate the broader world in unexpected ways. From my perspective, the key to the success of this process is that we have largely managed to abandon our expectations of what should happen in the space we have created together. There is no right or wrong way of proceeding. We come together for a few hours and go on a journey which is determined solely by our individual and joint sense of what should happen in the moment. We do try to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to check in, but apart from this there are no rules. I've described these two initiatives because they are my personal reference points into a set of energies which are emerging everywhere. While the ways they are set up and the names they are called vary, there is a profound convergence between their styles and their purposes. 
One of our challenges is to link these efforts so that people can recognize that they are part of a broad movement to which they already belong. This is important because many people still feel they are alone rather than being involved in the broad and increasingly active effort toward fundamental change which already exists. I am convinced that much of the reason why the ideas we have discussed in these programs are not more broadly visible is that we are using different words to describe the same reality. It is dialogue which will permit us to discover our shared beliefs and goals. We need this dialogue at levels which range from the family and the neighborhood to the global. Perhaps the most hopeful trend of our time which is emerging from this dialogue is the growing understanding that cooperation is the key to the future. We see this happening in business as firms both compete and work together in various activities. The civic sector is also realizing that it can only expect to realize its positive agendas if it creates broader coalitions. There is fortunately immense energy ready to be catalyzed which will enable us to recognize the potentials of the 21st century. This is a time for courage and risk. It is a time to argue for a higher vision of human purpose. This is a moment when the actions of each of us can make a profound difference. You too can become involved in discovering the positive future which is available to us. I hope that this set of programs has played a role in moving you to a point where you are ready to do so. The final question I therefore ask you to consider is what role you choose to play in creating a higher quality of life for the 21st century.